See, randomized controlled trials, in fact, they occupy a very enviable position in the hierarchy of different trials, different study designs. Okay, when you see group or grade the studies into different categories, say you have the meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, they occupy the highest form of, say, an evidence-based medicine like. We will be covering some aspect of meta-analysis too tomorrow. Okay. And at least one very well conducted RCT that also enjoys the same sort of a grade, A grade. Okay. You have something on a randomized control design and then the, the randomized control design says that the efficacy of this is this many percentage more than this. That has got a very good level of evidence for that particular drug. The next category are at least one well-designed control study without randomization. It's not always possible to do a randomized control design. Of course, we'll be rather seeing when I'm going to discuss about the RCTs, you will see it is not possible to do RCT every time. Okay? So if you have a uncontrolled or a controlled study, but you have not randomizing, then that have the second grain. At least one other type of well-designed quasi-experimental studies or a well-designed non-experimental descriptive studies, these all form an intermediate state of evidence, can give a B grade to them. And the last grade is the expert committee reports or opinion and or clinical experience of respected authorities. Okay. They form the least among the list of the evidence-based medicines. Okay, so we are going to see something about the very top grade evidence, namely RCTs. Okay. So generally speaking about observational studies and experimental studies. Okay. In the observational studies, you are not manipulating the exposure. You are just observing. You are not giving cigarettes to some people and then ask them to smoke. Okay. There is no experimentation. You are going to just observe how many people are smoking. Okay? That's a, an observational studies. Observational studies, again, can be divided into, say, analytic and descriptive. And experimental designs are the one where we are manipulating the exposure. Okay? We are going to rather give drug A to one group, drug B to other group. Okay? This is our choice. The intervention we are making, it's an experiment. Okay, that's why it's called an interventional study. You are intervening. Okay, and clinical trials are an example of an experimental design. Okay, so the results of any epidemiological study that may reflect the true effect of an exposure on the development of disease. See, we have various measures in epidemiology, odds ratio. That is one on relative risk. All these measures are called measures of association. That means what it measures is whether the exposure and the disease fact condition are associated. More the exposure, more the disease. Less the exposure, less the disease. Is there any sort of a, an association? That's what these sort of a measures of association. Sometimes what happens, you know, this association may be truly because these two are related or may be due to some sort of a spurious reasons too. We are not very sure about it. So, there is, if you really want to rather say whether the association is the causal, we need to rather have some other measures to rather say, yeah, it's a strong, so in fact, there is a criteria whenever when we are working on, it's sort of a outbreak. We have we apply a thing called Hills criteria, causality criteria. There are seven such criteria. One of these is, is an exposure to this your odds ratio. Okay? Various other criteria are there. We try to rather put all these criteria, and if several of these criteria are satisfied, then we say there is a possible causal relationship. Otherwise, you know, this sort of an association, there can be several, several spurious associations. Okay? The export of steel and uh, the uh, incidence of uh, mental disease 
may be highly associated. You can't rather, rather say whether the export of steel has got any relationship with either it has caused mental illness, we can't rather say. But when you really do an association, there may be a very large association. Just by chance that this also has increased, this also has increased. Okay? Both of them have increased. So when you do an association, you may find there is a very positive correlation among them. But they each one may not rather cause the other. Now, there are three possibilities of this association which we have to rule out. One is that association due to chance. By chance, we have found they are highly associated. Okay, you have to rule out chance. The second one is is there any bias? Bias can completely give a totally different pictures, and so you've got to be extremely careful in handling bias. Okay? Or are there any confounders? Okay. See, confounders to a certain extent you can handle at the stage of denial analysis also. See, um, there are certain analytical methods which take care of confounders. But bias, you have got to be careful at the study design stage itself. Okay. They are things which are very, very difficult to handle once you already have a data. Confounders, at least when you have a data, you can manipulate, you can do some sort of an analysis to control for those confounders. So these three elements may play a, an important role in giving you a sort of a spurious association. You'll have to rule out. Okay. Now, let's rather talk about bias in epidemiological studies. Bias, as we have all seen, this is a systematic error. That's, in other words, it's a non-random error that introduces distortion in the estimates or results. There are several bias, the important one being the selection bias, information bias, the confounding bias. There are several biases because there are many, many uh, types of biases are there. The most important thing are the selection bias and the information bias. Okay. What is the advantage of a randomized control design? The randomized control design, it is a methodologic standard of excellence for scientific experiment. And in fact, in the Lancet quotation, RCT has probably contributed more than any single scientific discovery to the improvement in medical care. So that is the importance that has been given to RCT. What does it does is, is one of the, say, their main scientific advances in the methods of clinical research in the 20th century. You see, these are all the praises of RCT slide. RCT is considered as the gold standard for demonstrating therapeutic efficacy for a pharma pharmaceutical agent. And the efficacy is not transferable from one goal to another. Okay, see here, there is a saying in Tamil, you know, Talaveli poga, Tiruguveli vandade. You take tablet for one thing and you get into some other aspect. See, this takes care of that also in RCTs because the side effects, toxin, all those things are considered for that. So now let's try to see what exactly is the RCT. We talked about this bias and things and all. One of the main positive aspect of RCT is the RCT controls the selection bias. Selection bias is minimal in an RCT trial design. Okay. A clinical trial is a planned experiment designed to assess the efficacy of a treatment in humans by comparing the outcomes in a group of patients treated with a, you have a test treatment with those observed in a comparable group of patients receiving a control treatment, where patients in both groups are enrolled, treated and followed over the same period in the same manner. Any ambiguity about this definition? So you have two groups. One group is given the test treatment and another group is given the control treatment. But all the other aspects are one and the same for them. Okay, they are observed in a same manner till the end. So the NIH definition of an RCT is an R 
scientific research activity undertaken to define prospectively the effect and value of either prophylactic or diagnostic or therapeutic agents. Because it's say now it's, the, the, it's expanding, you know, the uh, therapeutic agents, devices, regimens, procedures, etc. apply to human subjects. So it is essential that the study be prospective and that the intervention of some sort occur. Two aspects are covered here. The study is prospective. Okay? Like the case control study, you are not going to look at the retrospective aspect of it. You are going to prospectively see, or that's why they are all called follow-up studies. You are going to follow up them over a period of time. And there is some sort of an intervention. There is no intervention, then it becomes an observational study, a cohort study. Because there is an intervention, it is an RCT. Okay. So now let's just rather take an example of uh, to see the paradigm of RCT. There is a population of interest. Now let's rather take children less than or equal to five years presenting at a hospital with severe malaria. Okay. Now you are going to randomize them for treatment. Give a particular test treatment to some. I have put this as placebo. It is. Take that as control treatment. Okay. There is a huge issue. Whether you, know, you can't, whether some child come to a hospital, you can't treat some and you cannot treat the other guy. Okay. You'll have to give them some sort of a treatment, a standard therapy, the best treatment that's available to them. And that's, we call them as a probably a control treatment. And you assess their outcome at the end of seven days. Okay. Now, see, there are different phases of RCT. They are all called phase 1 trial, phase 2 trial, phase 3 trial, phase 4 trials. Now, in fact, I attended a meeting on, uh, last year on phase 2B trials. Okay? So, the people are trying to relax a little bit of things in uh, these sort of a phases to call um, uh, phase 2B, phase 2A and stuff like that. Overall, what do we mean by a phase 1 trial is the phase 1 trial is the very first trial that we do as, with a particular drug like. Our interest is, is to rather see it is more on the safety. Okay, first of all a drug that you are going to employ should be safe. Next only it comes to the question of its efficacy. Okay, so these are all the safety trials which are done in a clinical pharmacology or toxicity effect of it, it is done usually on some very limited human volunteers and it will be done mostly in a hospital settings. Phase 2 trials are, say suppose you know if it is very encouraging in the phase 1 trial, it is promoted to phase 2 trial. In phase 2 trial, initial clinical investigation of the treatment effects, how efficacy is that particular treatment is and it is done on patients but again on a small number in an hospital settings. Okay. And once it passes through the phase 2, then it goes comes for a phase 3 trial which is a full scale evaluation of the efficacy of the drug. Okay. And that is done on a patients randomly allocating the standard and then the test regimens and it is done either in the hospital study or in a, in a community setup. This is the usual uh, phase 3 trial or the one which are getting reported to the various journals and you know considered as an RCT. Okay. Phase 4 trials are post marketing surveillance. So, if some drug is efficacious in phase 3, then you know the licensing authorities and things and all they give licensing for manufacturing it and marketing it. Once it is in the market, then on the after marketing they do a phase four trial to see whether how efficacious the drug is in the practical circumstances. Phase one clinical trial usually carried out in normal individuals, human volunteer to examine clinical pharmacology of a new drug. It concerned with safety of the drug in humans and studies drug metabolism, bioavailability, dose ranging, various things are seen in that phase 1 trial. 
and phase two trial it evaluates effectiveness of a drug based on clinical endpoints, dosing ranges and doses of phase three trial, common short term side effects and risks associated with the drug. So lots of your planning for your phase three trial depends on the results of your phase two. Okay. And phase two trial is the final stage in testing a new treatment in humans is primarily concerned with assessment of efficacy and safety studied under controlled conditions. I need to spend some time on sort of a controlled conditions like say that you are not going to rather give the drug just like that you know in the market you know some patient they come you prescribe this particular drug and then send him off. Okay. RCT is a control trial in the sense you are certain protocols are there, certain regimens are there for following up because it is a closely observed um, uh, treatment like. Okay. And we will be seeing you know the various aspects of it, so, you know how we can you know it is uh, blinding, masking and uh, how the endpoints are, whether it is objective or subjective, all those things we are going to let's see. But it is in a very controlled experimental situation like, say as though you are doing an experiment in a laboratory. Okay. And phase four trials are post-marketing trials to assess the incidence of adverse reactions and effect on morbidity and mortality in the population. Okay. Any doubt about this? Um, Phase 1, phase 2, phase 3, phase 4 trials. Now from now onwards when I say RCT it is phase 3 trials. So the classification of RCT that is you see when you are telling you know what sorts of an RCT it is that is based on different categories like type of intervention that could be either a therapeutic or preventive. Therapeutic say in the tuberculosis research center of Chennai, I have done several RCTs on various drug combinations you know, against tuberculosis and then they say you know today this particular combination is 80 percent effect and they come out with a new combination they say it is more efficacious. They try to rather have this 80 percent drug as a control drug and give a new test drug okay? and then they, they see whether it is more than 80 percent. Okay. This type of a therapeutic trials or phase 3 trials, a type of intervention is a drug. Prophylactic preventive trials are also called prophylactic trials, the leprosy vaccine trial. Okay. 1,73,400 people are vaccinated. Different, different, say some people were given vaccination of one type, some were given you know, different vaccination, some were not vaccinated and they were followed up for 15 years and then see in each group how many people they developed leprosy and then they, they evaluated the efficacy of the protective efficacy of the vaccine that is all a preventive trial. Okay. So yeah, RCT can be a therapeutic trial or a preventive prophylactic trial. Unit of randomization either I can either have individual randomization or a community as such a randomization. Say we, we did a study on uh, the vitamin A and its effect on the uh, um, morbidity, say the, the uh, diarrhea and ARI morbidity among infants. That was a trial we did. We did an individual randomization, individual child as they were given a mega dose of vitamin A or not. Okay. The same study was done earlier by another group in Madurai and they did a community. One whole community they gave vaccination, uh, they gave an intervention and one whole community they did not give intervention they compact. Okay. So, your randomization can be at the individual level or at a community level. Design, it could be a parallel, crossover, factorial. How many of you are comfortable with all these three? Uh, Parallel is at the same time you are going to either give this drug to some and that drug to the other. Okay. Crossover is the one, the same patient you give a drug once and then the another drug again. See, it's a, for example, you know, the, for the treatment of asthma. 
which are recurrent, you know. My first time, I am given this drug. Second board, I am given a different drug. So within a patient, I can rather have A, B. I can randomize that, okay. For some, I can give A first and then B next. For some, I can give B first and then A next. That sort of a design is called a crossover design. Factorial design is different doses you can rather have among the patients. Say, for example, this drug, this dose. Drug A, dose A, do, uh, low dose, high dose. Drug B, low dose, high dose. So, there are four combinations, two square. It is called a factorial design. So, your allotment is done, done in a two square fashion, which is a statistical design, you know, a factorial design. If you are going to rather do that, it is called a factorial design. The example for that was the tuberculosis prevention trial, the Thiruvallur, they did a factorial design to, effect, to evaluate the efficacy of BCG in protecting tuberculosis. And uh, so different strains of BCGs and different doses of BCGs were rather take simultaneously. You can get a simultaneous comparison of strain A low dose, strain A high, high dose, strain B low dose, strain A high, high dose with a placebo. Okay? And uh, you can have a comparison of which strain, which dose is the best as compared to the placebo. Okay? That sort of a design is called a factorial design. Then the sample size, fixed or sequential, how many of you know about it? Fixed, of course, right in the beginning, you will rather evaluate the sample size, your statistician will come and then, then say, Madam, uh, sir, you have got to rather do 230 people, you have to give dress drug A, and 230 people, you have to give dress B. Okay, that's a fix. So your trial goes on till you give 230 patients, for A, 230 patients for B. Sequential trial is a one where every individual E enters in. Okay. There is a decision rule. Is it enough or we need one more? Okay. Sequentially it is done. Okay. The trial, the design is in such a manner that okay, every individual, once he enters into it, then we have a decision whether we have to take the next guy or not or stop the trial there. Okay? This became very popular during the Second World War because it's, at that time you know, they wanted a quick results, fast results you know, and uh, the sequential trial, the whole uh, design of sequential trial were uh, developed and improved during the Second World War period. Then the randomization, there are different types of randomization. So I can have one whole lecture session on randomization itself. Okay. How to rather do a randomization, whether there are fixed method, adoptive method, or blocking, you can rather have you know block randomizations. Okay, going for and um, it's a, one of the main reasons why we do this randomization is to avoid selection bias. A very well conducted randomized trial have very minimal selection bias because selection is not in your hand. Okay, it is randomly done and one of the greatest property of randomization is randomization has two important properties. One, it makes all your statistical tests valid. Later on when you want to compare and do a statistical test, they, it has to be a random experiment. Okay. Number two, randomization, what it does is known or unknown, measurable, non-measurable, okay? All those values, they try to rather make it equally distributing between these two arms. See, when you are going to rather do matching, you may rather say, you know, I want rather put this man or uh, 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 sex as one, this age group as one. You may have some limited uh, number of parameters on which you can probably do a matching. You want rather have the same proportion in these two groups. There may be several other factors which you don't know may be influencing and you may not be properly matching. By randomization, that is done automatically. Then last aspect, it depends on masking. Okay. Masking is also called blinding. Okay. A trial could be a single blind trial. Single blind trials are the patient doesn't know what treatment he is receiving. 
that the, in fact, when you go to a cl any clinician, physician, it is a single blind treatment only. The doctor never says what treatment he gives and what sorts of a diagnosis. Double blind is both the patient and the doctor doesn't know. And then a triple blind die, even the statistician who analyzes doesn't know. Okay. It's coded and the decoding is done only after the analysis. All the analysis you'll be doing drug A, drug B. Okay. You will not know whether drug A is a test drug or drug B is a test drug. Okay. At the end you will say drug A efficacy is this much. Drug B efficacy is this much. And drug A is statistically significant than drug B. Then at the end of it, they decode and then say whether A is a test drug or B is a test drug. Okay? That's a triple blind because the statistician can also bias, you know, say, I can rather um, give certain examples of bias in, say, the how uh, this at the time of analysis or an interim analysis that can rather. So there was a trial on um, uh, an intervention of certain packages okay, for a pregnant woman. Okay? And the outcome measure was the birth weight of a child after delivery. So the hypothesis is that a particular package is the best one, a high risk approach. So you get the best result, you get the best maximum say the birth weight is the maximum in that group okay so this dial was done i know it's a, it was and, and the statisticians did an interim analysis okay and uh, they found that mothers who were not given any package their birth the, the children were weighing more than the so called the intervention mothers okay it was not on full sample size but it was the, the, the uh, investigation was almost rather halfway through, like when we did the first interim analysis. One disadvantage was the principal investigator was also involved in the interim analysis. So later on, what happened? The next half of the study, she went and she blasted all the AMs. She said, "You are not giving this package properly. That this and all, because if you had given, how can the children be?" less weight than the children who don't receive any package and things and all. So the INMs they got the message well. They hiked you know, 200 grams, 400 grams more than uh, every child that they measure. <laughs> so the second half what happens, the test package, the children were weighing much, much better than the. <laughs> so this bias was, you know, introduced because the analysis was done and the analysis person knows which is which package. Suppose if that is coded at that stage, okay, this type of a mistake would not have happened. Okay? So of course we will be seeing about that also when we are seeing the interim analysis. Interim analysis is good, but at the same time you know you've got to be careful about an investigator bias coming into it. Okay? Person is doing a uh, double blind study um, is not in a position to give uh, the results or no unless we... unless it is specifically mentioned in the, their protocol that they are going to see it is not necessary that you have to rather do an interim analysis again and again say the protocol may say at the end of one and a half years we will do an interim analysis okay. could be your protocol if and they will have to okay. adhere to that protocol um, it was not mentioned in the protocol so I was just wondering because I was reviewing the results of the first annual report, which was absolutely not given. So that is uh, why. Uh, in fact, that's one of the component of the protocol, okay. stopping rules, you know. Okay. So uh, when to do an interim analysis, they are all a part of the protocol. So in observational studies, the statistical method allow investigators to control for confounding factors. But what is the one of the criteria for that? See, in observation studies, there are confounders. I said, you need not worry about confounders. You'll have to worry more about bias, <coughs> not the confounders. Confounders could be tackled even at the time of analysis. But for me to tackle in the time of analysis, what should be done? I should have information about it. Okay, I should have information about it. I should have measured it. 
okay? If sex is a confounder, in my data set, I should have the sex as one of the parameters in it. Suppose if I have not rather noted whether it is a male or a female, I can't adjust it in my analysis. So my data should have that, okay? So now, let's say that uh, I said uh, RCT is something really good, but it requires a tremendous amount of methodological rigor. Improperly conducted RCTs are, it's an enormous resource waste. You can rather improperly do a case control study, a cohort study, that's no problem, okay? But if you do an improper RCT and at the end of it, a very stressful uh, one, uh, one year end, uh, the RCT and somebody looks at it, it said, you know, there are lots of bias in it, it is not done properly, it's waste, it's a huge resource waste, okay? So, researchers must devote assiduous attention to design and conduct of RCTs. I have, uh, I'm from uh, Chennai ICMR, we are staying in the same campus of Tuberculosis Research Center. Tuberculosis Research Center is the one which is earlier called as Tuberculosis Chemotherapy Center. Right from 1950s they have been rather doing RCTs. Their first RCT is on the uh, domiciliary versus institutional treatment of tuberculosis. That's a historic uh, result. They said you know, domiciliary treatment is as good as an institutional treatment. Prior to that, when a person gets tuberculosis, he will be put under the, in a sanatorium. And the treatment is given only in sanatoria. After that particular trial, they said there is no need to go for sanatoria. You can rather treat him at home itself. Okay? Right from that, they have been, I think they have conducted more than 50, 60 trials. This is the latest trial number, I don't know. For each trial, they have a number. And the rigor with which they do, it's um, something, you know, uh, maybe irritating to uh, the principal investigator. Okay. Sometimes the principal investigator will not allow inside a room <laughs> where all these data and all are there. Okay. And statisticians are called watchdogs. Okay. They will bark, <laughs> send them out. Like, okay. See, that type of a rigor is required to do an acid. If that sort of a rigor is not there, RCT may not see one advantage of an RCT is it gives an unbiased one. But by all intervention, there will be some bias is introduced, and so it loses its value as a, an unbiased stuff. So you have to either be very, very rigor and uh, only properly conducted RCTs will fulfill their promise of minimizing bias. Otherwise, there will be bias and uh, so that is, I, I'm going to rather talk something on the evidence-based medicine. Um, there is a, something called uh, systematic uh, reviews, systematic reviews. And, you know, in systematic reviews, you know, all RCTs, you know, the published RCTs will be looked with a lens microscope. <laughs> and if there is any bias, it will be thrown out. <laughs> See? Okay. So, the... Uh, it's a good study, provided it is done well. You must have that sort of a message from here. So advantage, the first and foremost, the only effective method known to control selection bias. RCT is the only known method which can rather minimize the selection bias. It controls confounding bias without adjustment because, you know, randomization is there. Facilitates effective blinding in some trials. Not all trials can be barrier blinding. Say, for example, one of the trials that we did on anal fistula, the two regimens where one is a surgery and another is a, a medicated thread called Shara Sutra, you can't blind. Okay. So the patient and the doctor know what is the treatment. It, can, it is not a blind trial. So not all trials can be blind. Theoretically attractive, many statistical methods assume random assignment, so it's a very attractive and elegant trial design. So it, and also it maintains the advantage of cohort. You are taking a cohort of guys with 
treatment A guys with treatment B and you are following them okay prospectively so it is a cohort design which is very advantageous but there are equal number of disadvantages in a an RCT it's very complex and expensive it's not easy to do an RCT it involves a lot of resources prohibitively difficulty if and expensive with low incidence say when you are treating with handling with rare diseases that's why when you look at cancer research most of the studies are case control designs okay there are very few designs which can rather get into an RCT on such sort of a rare diseases may lack representativeness because volunteers may differ from see this particular point we can rather really spend a lot of time in the sense that say when you are going to ask for informed consent okay people who say yes I am agreeable and people who say I am not agreeable may be of different uh, texture okay so you are going to now do that study only on people who say they are agreeable all the people who say yes I am agreeable may have a different characteristic by themselves okay so that is some sort of a bias you can't rather say you know there is no bias at all so there is it may have some lack of representativeness ethical challenges of experimental research if I am going to rather put one case control study for a ethical clearance 27 studies were cleared in two hours <laughs> one RCT may take several rounds of discussion they can probably do it in one sitting and RCT okay so that's the difference like last month we had 27 case controls of our uh, scholars uh, done in two three hours <laughs> they cleared it okay so sometimes it is impossible or impracticable to conduct an RCT okay if you have any doubts clarifications till this point can you compare randomized with case case control my impression is randomized is interventional case control is descriptive yeah right yeah so they are not on equal platform yeah. nor are their goals similar they are not right so this is an experiment and that's observation so, but you can compare the results in uh, meta-analysis Me see meta-analysis is the one you know can be rather you can do a meta-analysis of different designs also okay can do a meta-analysis of case control studies and then try and rather get some better what meta-analysis does is, is, is they <coughs> tries to get a summary of all the studies that are done okay at different points of time at different places you try to rather pull them all together in some way and then try to get one single measure to say you know to give a better estimate of that okay that can be rather done the systematic review Cochrane systematic review it does only on the RCTs now I'll uh, start with the study outcome measures tomorrow